All right, get me all the pillows here. There we go. Blanket up, just don't cover the microphone there. And all right, so I could take it easy today because I'm just introducing a video we already made. Let me grab this so I don't have to look all the way over there. So much for that blanket. I do have shorts on, by the way, just in case you were curious. I mean, I don't have to have anything on from the waist down because the camera don't capture it, but I'm just letting you know for reference. You know, if you're putting a visual picture in your mind, put some shorts on me. Anyway, so there was this virtual Catholic apologetics conference and due to some sort of oversight, I'm guessing, we were allowed to talk at it. So today we're just reposting that video here. However, you can sign up and watch all of the conference videos. There is a lot of great content there. Christians like Trent Horn, Matt Frad, Bobby and Jackie, Deacon Harold, Jimmy Aiken, and more. You can purchase a pass today and get access now through November 1st, 2021 which should probably be just around when we're allowed outdoors again. There are over 50 recorded presentations and premium live session replays. They're great for group study. You've got epic fireside chats, full downloadable MP3s. That's better than just half downloadable because then you're just sitting there waiting for the thing to stop spinning. That's where it's at, the full ones. There's also an apologetics ebook library, Frad vs. Bertuzzi debate replay, and then the other stuff on this list that I'm just too lazy to read right now. It was two things. I know, I said I'm lazy. Thank you to the folks at the Virtual Catholic Apologetics Conference for letting us have a presentation there. Thank you to Matt Frad for suggesting that we are asked. Matt Frad somehow got them to contact us, so thank you. Mr. Fred for that. And thank you to everyone who watched the video. Thanks for leaving all those nice comments. And thank you for coming here and subscribing to the channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can do that by clicking on the button that says subscribe. It's very easy. Then you can click the bell, all. You can click on the like button on any video. Actually, just do it on all the videos. Why not? Pokemon the thing, just catch them all. Also in the comments, let me know, did you go to the conference yet? Or are you going to sign up for the conference? And if you did watch the conference already, or at least some of the conference, I haven't seen all of the conference yet. There is a lot of content on there. But let everyone know something new you learned from the conference. I will break in during our replay of our video to explain something new that I learned. But we'll get to that when we get to that. Let's get this thing started now. Get all comfortable and whatnot. <sighs> How's he supposed to watch with his eyes closed? I already saw it, okay? I was literally there for the video. <sighs> hey there, Virtual Catholics Apologetics Conference people. That just rolls right off the tongue. You might not be familiar with who I am, so introductions would be useful at this point, but we just don't have that time. So welcome to Apologetics 101. Did you see what we did there? We took apologetics and we're giving tips on apologetics. So we just flipped that C, made it a P, now we got the two words in one. By the way, this completely necessary explanation is why I don't have time for an introduction. Today I've got 10 tips for talking with Protestants. Tip number one, clear the debris. An important thing to realize if you're talking to a Protestant is that they've probably been told several false things about Catholic Christianity. As Fulton Sheen said, there are not 100 people in the United States who hate the Catholic Church, but there are millions who hate what they wrongly perceive the Catholic Church to be. So you're gonna have to clear that debris. There's gonna be a lot of garbage in the way, a lot of stuff they think you believe that you don't actually believe. Don't get upset with them because most of the time it's not that they're trying to misrepresent you, it's that they've been taught by someone who they trusted that this is what you believe. So here's a suggestion that might help. Ask them right at the start. What do you disagree with about Catholic Christianity? Most of the time what they think is Catholic Christianity isn't even Catholic Christianity. So usually your response can be, I disagree with that too because that's not even a Catholic Christian teaching. For instance, one falsehood that you'll hear a lot is that Catholic Christians believe in a works-based salvation. And you might think, well, that's not wrong. Salvation is based on works. It's based on God's works. That's usually not what a Protestant means when they say works-based salvation. Usually they'll say works-based salvation to mean that you need to do works in order to make your salvation possible. And God can't save you all by himself. That is not what Catholic Christians believe. Catholic Christians believe that God makes salvation possible without our help, and he gives us this gift out of his grace. In the book of Catholic Christian teachings, otherwise known as the Bible, Paul records this by telling the Ephesians, God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He goes on to say, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So this gift is not your own doing. This gift came from God. So while it is a works-based salvation in the sense that God did the work to give us that salvation, 
It's not a works-based salvation in the sense that we did the work to create that salvation. But when someone gives you a gift, thank you, no one even attached the bow. I have to hold the bow. When you're given a gift, you're not forced to keep the gift. I have this gift now. It was given to me. I didn't do anything to earn this gift. None of my works got me this gift. But I am doing work right now to hang on to the gift. I could also do a work and reject the gift. We're talking about two different things there. One, does God need us to work in order to create salvation? The answer to that is no. Our salvation is a gift from God. By His grace, people have been saved. The second question though is, can our works have any effect on the possession of this gift once we have it? And the answer to that is yes. Even Paul tells the Corinthians this. He says, I would remind you brothers of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. So Paul is writing this letter here to the church of God that is in Corinth. And Paul is telling these people who are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they are being saved if they hold fast to the word that he preached to them. If you do this work of holding fast to the word, then you are being saved. Is this Paul teaching a works-based salvation as Protestants define a works-based salvation? No, because Paul's not saying that they create the salvation. As Paul told the Ephesians, the salvation is a gift from God. So that's how Paul answered the first question. But when you get to the second question, can our works play a role in maintaining that gift? The answer to that is yes. People who are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ can continue being saved if they do this work. Now the advice to clear that a break goes both ways, they shouldn't be assuming what you believe and you shouldn't be assuming what they believe. This can help so you both don't waste a bunch of time arguing about a certain word or phrase, such as workspace salvation, only to learn later that your definitions of that word or phrase are completely different. So clear that a break at the start and you can save a lot of time. A conversation suggestion would be to continually ask, what do you mean by that? Tip two, don't ask for trust, ask for testing. A saying we use a lot here on how to be Christian is don't trust us test us. So many people these days are just blindly following other people without actually checking to see if those other people are telling them the truth. That's a bad idea. So what I would recommend in a conversation is say, don't trust me at my word. Don't trust your pastor at his word. Don't trust your friends at their word. Don't trust your parents at their word. Not because any of us would knowingly lie to a person. It's just we're all human so we can all make mistakes. Obviously, if I'm teaching one thing and your pastor, your friends, or your family are teaching the opposite thing, somebody's got it wrong. Don't just pick the side you like, actually test both sides. The Bible records this advice. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. James writes, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So in Christianity, there is a truth and people can wander from that truth. They can also be brought back. So if you're talking to a Protestant and they disagree with what you're saying, somebody's wandering from the truth. So in the conversation, you should both be able to say, hey, look, one of us has to be wrong. Let's do what Paul advised the Corinthians to do. Examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. Test ourselves. Because as Paul told the Corinthians, do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. So as the Bible records, you can test yourself and examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith and you could end up failing that test. The good thing about finding out you failed the test though is you can always correct what you failed at. And then you test yourself two seconds later with the correct belief and you passed. As the Thessalonians were told, test everything. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So when you're done testing yourself, whether you failed the test or passed the test, you can hold fast what is good and abstain from every form of evil. For instance, with the gift example, we can test this. Is it possible for someone to create and give me this gift without me doing any work to have that happen? Yeah. Is it also possible for me to do work to maintain possession of this gift? Yes, that's what I'm doing right now. Now, a common objection you might hear to this is, well, the gift that God is giving is eternal life. So once you have it, you can't lose it or else it's not really eternal life. Yeah, that objection doesn't make any sense, but still we test it because we test everything. So let's say this gift is an eternal supply of button down shirts. I open up the box and every time I do, there is another button down shirt inside. Thanks to the gift giver, I now have an eternal supply of button down shirts. But here's the thing, this was an eternal supply of button down shirts before I had it. Rewind to before I got it, it was still an eternal supply of button down shirts. As it was being handed to me, still an eternal supply of button down shirts. Right now, as I hang on to this gift, this eternal supply of button down shirts, it's an eternal supply of button down shirts. And if I do this and I reject the eternal supply of button down shirts, 
it's still an eternal supply of button-down shirts. I just don't have it anymore. So this objection makes no sense. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It doesn't say whoever believes in him should not perish but eternally have eternal life. The life is what is described as eternal, not our possession of the eternal life. Gifts that are described as eternal can be rejected. And when you reject a gift like eternal life, it can still remain eternal life even though it's not in your possession anymore. Because just like my possession of this gift didn't cause it to be an eternal supply of button-down shirts, it was an eternal supply of button-down shirts before I even got it. Same thing with eternal life. Eternal life can be eternal life before you have it, while you have it, and if you happen to reject it, even then it can remain eternal. But maybe try not to reject it. Now again, none of this is anything you need to trust my word on. Test it. Catholic Christians don't need to rely on blind trust because they have the facts on their side. So don't ask for trust. Ask for testing. Tip number three, have visuals. We use a lot of props here on how to be Christian. This is coming up later. That's because some people learn better when they can visualize the teaching. Why are you pointing at me? That's, that's so rude. That's, no, no, stop it. Ah, dang it. The Bible is a long book, so remembering what you learned in Romans 8 might not be fresh in your mind when you're talking about John chapter 6. And sometimes when you're reading one part of the Bible, you have to remember something you read somewhere else. If you're just talking and talking to somebody, things might start to run into each other and you can't really differentiate what you learned in one part and a different part. But if you say, hey, remember the bear thing with the yoga ball or the frozen two tattoo thing or the party cup thing or the state puzzle thing or the iron thing, that can help people to pick out that part of the conversation and be like, yeah, okay, now I remember. Also, if you look at the props that we use on the show, most of them are things you could just find laying around the house. So if you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone, there's usually something within reach, like books, your cell phone, a helmet, or playing cards, anything at all to help you to visually represent the teaching. Actually seeing the teaching play out can make it easier to learn and understand the teaching, and visuals can help the teaching stick with the person long after you're done talking about it. So on to tip four, avoid the prot vomit. I want to talk to you all about a devastatingly ridiculous ailment that plagues many a false teacher. It's called prod vomit. Prod vomit is when a Protestant false teacher realizes that they can't refute a single Catholic Christian teaching, so they begin to barf up unsubstantiated attacks on Mary, intercessions, the Pope, priest, purgatory, and other Christian teachings that they protest. Sometimes those suffering from severe cases of prod vomit will regurgitate all of that at the same time. So what you just heard from a person who believes that the this guy in Rome is actually the infallible vicar of Christ, believes that Mary was bodily assumed into heaven, that priests are the are altar priests to his place, it's called purgatory and things like that. Seriously though, prod vomit, it's a waste of time. This is a tactic that Protestants will use when they realize they can't actually prove the point that they're trying to make. For instance, we made a video where I was talking about the false doctrine of limited atonement, and I walked through the text of Romans 8 to prove my point. I used the visual aids of the cups in that video, and James White actually watched that video. Or at least he had the video playing while he was playing with his toys and practicing his fake yawn and bebopping along to who knows what and cheersing the audience. The point is he didn't seem to be paying much attention to the video, which probably explains why he never actually addressed the points that were made in the video. But anyway, it was during this playing of our video where he just blew his prop vomit chunks all over the place. So what you just heard from a person who believes that the this guy in Rome is actually the infallible vicar of Christ, believes that Mary was bodily assumed into heaven, that priests are the are altar priests to his place, it's called purgatory and things like that. Now those are topics that can be discussed, don't get me wrong, but those topics have nothing to do with what we were saying about Romans 8. Whether my beliefs on the Pope, Mary, priest, purgatory, and things like that are correct or incorrect, what I was saying about Romans 8 would not be changed by that. So why is Mr. White coming down with a case of the prop vomit? <laughs> because he can't refute what I'm saying about Romans 8. Mr. White is trying to change the subject here. The game that he's playing is to just throw a bunch of topics into the air, and hopefully that'll distract people enough so they don't look too closely at his false teaching. Avoid the prot vomit. We can talk about all these topics at a different time, but if you're having a conversation with a Protestant and it's about a topic that has nothing to do with these topics, don't let the prot vomit derail the conversation. You can put a pin in it, say, we'll come back to these topics, but whether I'm right about these topics or I'm wrong about these topics, they don't affect what we're talking about now. The usual reason for this type of behavior? So what you just heard from a person who believes that is because they know they can't prove what you're saying is wrong, so they're trying to flee to a different topic. Hang around where you are. Say, we'll come back to that. We're talking about this now. Ferris. Ferris, wake up. Oh, such a fascinating video so far, right? Anyway, what I learned was... Right, okay, so what I was calling prot vomit actually has a name. 
This was pointed out to us in the comments. There was someone named Killian and Anonymous, I think that's French, and also Matt Frad talked about it in his presentation. Prot vomit is commonly referred to as shotgun fallacy. So that was something new I learned and I found that interesting. I think I like prot vomit better just because the graphic. But it's good to know the actual name of it. Now, back to the show. Tip number five, pretend their false teaching is correct. When you're talking to a Protestant and they say, this is what I believe, try not to just dismiss that. Don't say, well, that's wrong. Here's what the actual teaching is. Instead, pretend that their false teaching is correct. For instance, Kenneth Yates, who is the pastor of Little River Baptist Church in Jenkinsville, South Carolina, wrote an article where he was trying to disprove the literal meaning of eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he says, while many have seen an allusion to the Lord's Supper in Jesus' words about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, this is not likely because the Lord's Supper has not yet been instituted. So what Yates has done here is create something we like to call a Protestant patch. The Protestant patch is when a Protestant tries to cover up a hole in their teaching by creating a patch that is just complete nonsense. So the Protestant patch here is if an event has not happened yet, then it is not likely that anyone would be talking about that event. So let's pretend that that false teaching is correct. That would mean that when the angel visited Mary and told her she would conceive a son in the future and his name would be Jesus, it's not likely that that angel was talking about the birth of Jesus because that hadn't happened yet. And when the book of Revelation records a whole long prophecy of things that will happen in the future, it's not likely that that's talking about future events because they haven't happened yet. And when Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, it's not likely that he's talking about the temple of his body and how he would raise up after three days because that hadn't happened yet. Oh, except for the fact that the Bible literally tells us that that's what Jesus was talking about. So the patch that Kenneth created helped him in one situation, but then when you apply it to these other situations, it becomes clear that his patch makes no sense at all. So pretending that a nonsense claim actually makes sense can be helpful when talking to Protestants because then you're not just saying, well, you're wrong, here's the correct teaching. You're saying, okay, well, what if you're right? Here's what would happen, and what would happen is just ridiculous. So that's what your teaching gets us, but here's a different teaching, and it's not crazy. For the most part, I think Protestants are sincerely interested in following Jesus. Again, as Fulton Sheen said, they have a really weird idea of what the Catholic Church teaches, and also they've become convinced that what they believe is correct. It's not that they know it doesn't make sense and they believe it anyway. It's just that no one has explained to them yet how out there their teachings are. So when you show them what their teaching gets them, and then you show them the other teaching that they could be believing in, I'd like to think that most of them would choose the saner teaching. So play pretend, because oftentimes you can prove that a Protestant teaching is incorrect just by imagining a world in which it's correct. Tip six, veganize the verses. What does that mean? It means you take the stakes out of it. What? Yeah, that was a pun. When Protestants defend a false teaching, they usually have a verse from the Bible that they think proves what they're saying. For instance, many go to 2 Timothy 3 in their failed attempts to prove sola scriptura. Sola scriptura is a false teaching held by many, if not all, Protestants. It states that scriptures are the only infallible source of information on Christianity and that they are the supreme authority for Christians. Sola scriptura does allow for other sources of authority to exist, but these other authorities are not infallible and they are subject to the scriptures. None of those claims are true, but this guy, Martin Luther here, he came up with that about 500 years ago and we're still cleaning up his mess. Now, I don't understand this, but for some reason, Protestants can look at these verses and be convinced that this teaches sola scriptura. My guess is that since they have so much writing on those two verses, they can't see it any other way. So take the stakes out of the conversation. Instead of talking about all scripture, we're talking about a different noun now, like a remote. And we were told that that noun was breathed out by God, so that's where it came from. Well, now we can tell you where the remote came from. Next, we were told what the noun was profitable for. And there were four things listed, so let's list four things that this remote is profitable for. And that noun from the beginning allows the man of God to be complete, equipped for every good work. So we can match that and say that the remote allows for the man of relaxation to be complete, equipped for a marathon of 24. So now we have the exact same type of statement being made, except we're not talking about Christian specific things. So now that we've veganized the verse, we can start asking questions. Like does this teaching say that the remote is the only thing that the TV manufacturer made? No. The remote is from the TV manufacturer but it doesn't say the remote is the only thing the TV manufacturer made. The TV manufacturer probably made TVs too. Maybe they make DVD players, washing machines, refrigerators. If a Protestant is being honest, they have to say the answer to this question is no. So then go back to the Bible passage and ask the same question. Does this teaching say that all scriptures are the only thing that are breathed out by God? Because the answer to that again is no. God breathed out way more than the scriptures. The scriptures even record the fact that there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. 
So there goes the whole scriptures are the only infallible source of Christian teachings theory. Protestants cannot say that's the definite teaching of 2 Timothy 3. Because if they do try to say that, then they also have to say that this is the only thing that the TV manufacturer made. And you can go through the rest of the analogy like that. The remote's profitable for these four things. That's true, I can do all four of those things with this remote, but I don't need the remote to do those things. I could just walk over to the TV and accomplish all four of these tasks without the remote. Same with all scriptures. They're profitable for these four things, but people were doing these four things just fine before the scriptures even got written. And yeah, the remote allows me to be complete, equipped for a marathon of 24, but if I just have the remote and I don't have the TV or electricity going into the TV or all these seasons of 24, or the batteries, if I don't have them, because remember, it just said the remote. If this is all I have, am I complete, equipped for this marathon of 24? No. This is like the least effective part of the process of having a marathon of 24. This is more of a luxury so I don't have to get up and touch the TV. Now I don't say that to knock the importance of scripture, it's just to prove a point that this statement doesn't tell us that scriptures are supreme. It doesn't tell us anything that sola scriptura teaches. And if you're talking to a Protestant and they won't admit to that, then just hand them this remote, send them into an empty room, and say, enjoy the 24 marathon. Because if they believe this gets them sola scriptura, then they have to believe this gets them sola remota. Now a common thing you might hear is, well, your analogy is wrong. And to that you could say, okay, well, tell me what's wrong and we'll fix it. Now will the analogy that you're coming up with actually be wrong? Probably not. Analogies are fairly simple to come up with, but let them try to fix it anyway, because if you did make a mistake, then you can both fix it together. Or in the more likely scenario, they'll be trying to fix something that just isn't broken. By veganizing the verses and talking about something like remotes instead of scriptures, Protestants really have nothing to lose when it comes to the remote conversation because you've taken the stakes out of it. Most of the time, they're probably gonna agree with everything you're saying about the analogy. And that's when you ask him, why would you treat this verse any differently than this verse? The only reason they treat it differently is because they want 2 Timothy 3 to say so much more than it actually says. Tip 7. Remember the timeline. Now this one might sound complicated, but it's actually very easy. You don't need to know the dates, you just have to have common sense. All we need to know is where the past is, where the present is, and the order of events. As mentioned before, use visuals. Don't just talk about the timeline, get a piece of paper, pen, or a marker board. Okay, we got the past, we got the future. We have events that take place on this timeline, like Paul wrote this letter to the churches of Galatia. So right there, Paul wrote letter. That does not look like the word letter, but that's what it's supposed to be. He said, I'm astonished. So if Paul's writing a letter here and in the letter he's saying he's astonished, then before he wrote the letter, he had to be astonished. So these two points can be really close, or really far away, scale doesn't matter. So why was he astonished? Because they were so quickly deserting him who called them in the grace of Christ and were turning to a different gospel. So a few things we just learned there. One, Galatians got a gospel, and we'll call that gospel A. After they got the gospel, they turned to a different gospel. We'll call that gospel B. All right, so after that, Paul found out, so put another point on there. Paul learns of turn, and then he got astonished, and then he wrote the letter. And eventually, the letter was viewed as scripture. Now that doesn't mean the letter became scripture here. It was still scripture back here. This is just when people realized, hey, that is scripture. And what else does Paul tell us? He says, not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Okay, so they taught the Galatians a gospel. So that actually goes before the Galatians got the gospel. All right, so now we know Paul taught gospel A, the Galatians got gospel A, they turned to gospel B. Then Paul learned that they turned. He got astonished. And then he wrote a letter, which later got recognized as scripture. But if sola scripture is correct, then how did Paul teach the gospel before he ever wrote down what the gospel was? You see, time doesn't allow for sola scripture to actually be correct. Because you can do this for every verse in the Bible. People always knew the gospel before it got written down. Scripture is not the only infallible source of Christian teachings. Because guess where Paul got the gospel from? God taught Paul. God taught Paul. Maybe not directly on all issues, but everything that Paul got, if you work backwards, you eventually get to God. So God is the infallible source of all Christian teachings, not a writing that showed up way later. Looking at the timeline helps to show just how weird Sola Scripture is, because the teaching here was known at this point in time too. It was also known at this point in time, and 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 this point in time. So if this same teaching was known at all these points in time, then how is this the only infallible source of Christian teaching when Paul was literally teaching the same thing back here and God's been teaching the same thing 
since whenever he started teaching. So yeah, timelines are not that hard to put together. You just need common sense. Clearly when this guy came up with Sola Scriptura, common sense was not on the menu. Tip eight. If you want to make a list that's 10 items long, but you can only think of nine, feel free to make tip number eight a joke. It won't come across as lazy at all. Tip number nine. Separate the belief from the believer. On the show, I make fun of false teachings a lot. I refer to them as nonsense, stupid, ridiculous, because they are. However, these people, these people who are teaching those ridiculous teachings, they are not ridiculous. This is just my opinion, but I think all these people are very smart. These people are fellow Christians. They're Protestants at the moment, but they can all be brought back from their wandering to the truth. The reason I would never make fun of any of these people is because look at all these people. These are all Christians who used to be Protestants as well. They may have believed in some dumb things, but it's not like they knew they were dumb teachings. And Protestants might go years and years without ever researching what they believe in. So while you might know that soul scripture doesn't make any sense, they haven't looked into it. That doesn't make them stupid. That just means that they trusted someone who told them, hey, this is the correct Christian teaching. Fortunately, the Bible records this advice for us to test ourselves, to see whether we are in the faith. These are all Christians who used to be Protestant Christians. They're super smart people. And they didn't just become super smart when they left Protestantism. They were super smart when they were Protestants. Just like these people are super smart. So feel free to make fun of the belief all you want, but please don't make fun of the believers. Instead, say a prayer for them. We have people in the comments who talk about praying for Mr. White. That's great because maybe someday Mr. White can join all these people here as people who dropped the Protestantism and kept the Christianity. That all being said, I will make jokes about Luther here, but he's part of the show. He gets paid for that, okay? I'll just sprinkle some crumbs behind the couch and he's all... No, Luther. Luther. I was miming that. Idiot. It's not even payday yet. Now, number 10, if you don't know, then say so. Pretty self-explanatory. If somebody asks you a question and they say, hey, what do Catholic Christians believe about X? X being any topic at all. If you don't know, then say so. Don't just make something up. Don't just take a guess. If you're unsure, then say no more. If your answer ain't right, shut your mouth tight. I'm just trying to rhyme things now, but the point is, if you don't know about something, don't talk about it. Don't add to the wrongly perceived version of the Catholic Church that Fulton Sheen was talking about. Because with Catholic Christianity, there is one faith. We have a truth and you can wander from it. So if someone asks you for a Catholic teaching on something and you don't know it, then just be honest and say, that's not something I can help you with right now because I'm not sure. What I'll usually do is say, check the catechism. It's online and with the teachings there, it gives you citations. You can see where it's getting the teachings from. You can be told where to look in the Bible. Another thing I'll do since I'm on YouTube is I'll tell them, check out Catholic Answers. Check out that one Catholic girl, Trent Horn. Brian Holdsworth. For instance, we get comments about Mary. Tim Staples, we're always sending people your way. Get his book, watch his interview with Matt Frad, because I know Tim Staples knows a lot more about Mary than I do. And he's a former Protestant. So don't be afraid to admit that you don't know everything. I don't. I'm constantly calling myself an idiot because I am an idiot. People don't get it. I poked myself in the eye. My eye is still feeling that. But for the joke, I hope it was worth it. Anyway, that's it for me. This has been Apologet Tips. 101, 10 tips for talking with Protestants. Thank you all for watching. Thanks for everyone who put this conference on. I hope you all enjoy the other presentations, just not as much as you enjoyed this one, just a little bit less, if you can. Do that for me. And if anyone sees Trent Horn, you tell him Ferris was looking for him, okay? Just give him one of those for me. He'll know what it means. He probably won't, but I don't even remember why I'm mad at him. But I do know there is a very real rivalry going on. Catholic Answers has let me know of a possible restraining order. And I believe there's been talk of a cage match. Anyway, this is Abby Christian. You all have a great day. What? What is your problem? Oh. Hi, thank you for, for watching or, or re-watching or whatever you did here today. Thanks to everyone who was at the conference. Thank you to the people who let us into the conference for some reason. Those are very nice of you. And thank you again to Matt Frad for getting our name out there. I do want to say hello to all the new viewers. Hi everyone. Buzz, I'm speaking here. Feel free to say hi in the comments. We hear from people who are Catholic Christians, Protestant Christians, atheists, all different types of people. So anyone's welcome in the comments, join the conversation. This is Adam Christian. You have a great day. I did that on purpose. Yes, I did that on purpose. Okay, I was having a good dream, all right? Obama just gave me double A's. I was about to fly my shuttle. That does not make sense to the vast majority of people watching. So don't try to figure it out, okay? Just accept that I said it and go off and watch something else. Who's attack? What the?